Greetings to everyone. Lovely to be back here with you. Nice lunch. So I'm, I'm sure you'll be very attentive uh, as we're doing this. Um, as, we're, as we're getting the picture of what's coming, I think we have a sense that the wave of English Quran translation uh, originating in India during the first decades of the 20th century. Uh, and I like the way Bruce Lawrence put it. Uh, it, it served as a midwife to the modern Dua movement. So when we think about Dawa, and we're thinking about how these things really took uh, shape, uh, it, it goes hand in hand with translation. Anglophone Muslims seized upon the great potential to speak directly to a global audience through the lingua franca of an empire upon which the sun never set. From Wamali's translation to the outbreak of World War II, uh, at least seven separate English translations were completed from South Asia. Probably more, we'll see. Um, but from among these, none has gained such a wide usage and lasting appeal, in my opinion anyway, of that of Adullah Yusuf Ali. Favored by uh, some of our most internationally renowned uh, proselytizers and preachers like Ahmed Didat and Zach Malek, Yusuf Ali's translation was adopted by the conservative Saudi presidency, as been mentioned already before, and, and has been used extensively. It was the one made available. And so being made available, uh, it increased in its accessibility and it continues in great use today. Uh, today, I, I want to explore the interrelation on this idea of da'wah and Quran translation through this work and just take some time, if nothing else, to, to, personalize, to personalize the translator. And I think that's what can happen so much when we're coming with the concepts and trying to understand is we miss the, the actual experience of that person. So if nothing else today, I'm, I'm going into that and that's what caught my attention as being very important. Um, so from among the translators, I'd say he was not your likely candidate, okay? The son of a Shish Meili merchant from the Audi Bora community. He was a student of English literature, active in Freemasonry, strong rationalist in his thinking, you know, like Syed uh, Amr Ali and of course Syed Ahmed Khan. And he was a public so servant in the colonial government, uh, an advocate of the uh, British Empire against, right, the Ottoman uh, Khilafat movement and married to a Christian. With so many detractions, how do we account for, for his success? To situate the author and better gauge the complexities of this legacy, uh, we must revisit Lahore as a thriving center, uh, center of religious learning and debate, a region where Christian missionaries enjoyed government support. And we're seeing the conversion, not only of a few individuals, but of entire communities. More importantly, as I'll argue, this was a nexus of Islamic revivalism. There were parties expressing kind of this competing vision for fidelity. I'm gonna stay away from the word orthodox uh, as we've already touched on today, but fidelity, if, if, if we can go with that. Um, it was a context marked by vernacular translation. As a movement inaugurated the previous century and probably even before that in Delhi and Lucknow by vernacular translations that um, in a sense, they, they connected these two uh, areas of inquiry in Urdu. And so to understand what happens in English, I'm saying if we pull back a little bit and look at the Urdu experience, that might shed some light for us, okay? Uh, traditionalists and modernists of various hues as well as the Intuit Ahmadi movement uh, was steadily gaining appeal among the educated classes. They were locked in dynamic theological debates and this created a highly competitive atmosphere with each party developing their own reading of the Quran, Urdu. Arab and Persian, Arabic and Persian retained their currency in religious circles, but by the 19th century, was, these were increasingly filtered through English. Many of these were deeply formed. Many of these who were translators or engaged in this debates were deeply formed by British culture and literature. And it's from within this context that we can trace the progress of Abdullah Yusuf Ali as a writer and explore the distinctive elements of his work. And we'll see how he drew from a deep fluency in English literature and culture to prepare a reading that was natural 
for an audience as much as in Bristol as in Bombay. And I think that sense that he had a foot in both places was absolutely his strength. Cognizant of the diverse needs of his readership, Yusuf Ali succeeded in rendering a dynamic equivalence of the message within stylistic bounds that honored traditional Muslim expectations. He emphasized the opinion of classical commentators, including only minimal grammatical and theological points, and he avoided controversy and polemic. Because of his own experience as living as a Muslim in Britain, he actively sought points of contact, whether through science or literature, to lessen the distance from the text and to bring the reader into the experience of the Quran. And I think that's a key word throughout uh, my presentation today, and even as we read the commentary, he is, he's inviting you into the experience of the Quran in English, which is fascinating. So uh, to draw from his own words, he seeks to make English itself an Islamic language. Okay, a quick note on his biography. Uh, born in 1872, upward uh, mobile family uh, in Gujarat. He goes to a missionary college, as you probably know, Wilson College in, in Bombay, and uh, does very well. While he's there, he becomes involved in the uh, Himayat Islam group. Um, and uh, in a sense, he has a conversion of his own. He has a shift into this, this modern, rationalist, Sunni uh, way of uh, understanding faith. He goes on to Cambridge, does very well. And as his biographer, Mahmoud um, um, Sharif says, by the time he's 30 years old, the young Bombay scholar of modest means has become transformed into a self-assured Edwardian gentleman one of the first Indian Muslims to attain executive rank in the elite Indian civil service. So he's posted in India in 1895, uh, having great success and all that. In 1900, he marries Teresa May Shalders. He marries her at St. Peter's Church, right? They have three children. They all have Muslim names, Idris, Asghar, Yusuf Ali, Haider, uh, and a daughter, okay, Leila. So, uh, but as we're gonna see throughout this, the, the personal tensions, and again, I want to keep coming back to that personal experience of having children who are fully British, though his children, and then distant from him. I feel like that is going to be ever present for him in his translation. He does exceedingly well. He goes on, lots of success. Uh, he's knighted in 1917. He's appointed as a lecturer at London SOAS. But the success is marred by the personal loss experienced by the infidelity of his wife, which leads to a divorce in 1911. This sense of loss deepened, and by 1920, the children had, in his own words, turned against him with a vengeance, as he noted in the commentary, causing a rift from which the relationship, and I would say he personally would never recover. In 1920, he marries again, Gertrude Ann Malby, who unlike Teresa converts to Islam. The couple become active in the mosque there in East London, uh, along with other uh, English Muslims that are there. And again, it takes us into the Lahori circle, the, the Lahori Ahmadi circle, most, uh, most notably Khwaja Kamaluddin, uh, who's, who has a senior place of leadership there. It's a, it's a cosmopolitan experience. You know, where you have people at this time, yes, who are, are British, others who are Europeans from Germany, but it also becomes an international embassy. I think it's important to remember that. It becomes a place, if you're a foreign dignitary from a Muslim country and you come to England, you don't want to miss the opportunity to visit the mosque. Photographs and entries from the Islamic Review and other sources demonstrate the eclecticism of the group, which includes men and women from a range of nationalities, um, the, the topics that are touched on there deal with tolerance and emphasize a non-sectarian brand of Islam. There's a sense that they want to accommodate, to create a place in the British context uh, for the Islamic community and to have a sense for the British public of what it meant to be a British Muslim. So the translation by Han uh, was readily available there, as would be soon thereafter that Marmaduke of quick, quick fall. And so it's a place where even as he's contemplating going on to his own translation, uh, these, these ideas are already there. There is the understanding of the benefit and need for a English translation for this community and others that will come. All right, so that idea is already taking shape in his mind. 
Yusuf Ali returned to India with his wife, uh, with Gertrude and their son Rashid. Uh, and uh, the nearest retire, and as he comes to retirement, Muhammad Iqbal, you know, the famous poet of the East there in Lahore, invites him to become the principal of Islamia College in Lahore. And that is the flagship college of the Himayat Islam movement, the same one that he had joined as a young man. So there's a personal connection again there and a desire to be involved in that circle. He continues to succeed in public life, but again suffers personal loss with a second divorce and painful separation. Comments, again, you know, we don't know in the comments if he's reflecting on wife one or wife two, but there is a, a deep sense of loss uh, that, that is carried through there. He remarks, he remarks it on the emotional trauma um, and how this is a rekindling of religious sentiment in him. So the sense of loss is in a sense going to drive him deeper into a study of the Quran and in a, in a spiritual experience. And it's going to sustain him as he's going through the difficulty of producing it. So let's put this in context as we're dealing with Lahore. Okay, the fact uh, that the first Quranic translation movement in the history of Islam uh, originated in Delhi, at least I would think that, I'm learning about the Ottomans today, uh, I would say is not happenstance. Rather, it's indicative of the intellectual milieu there in Delhi. Undergirding this work was the sense that translation was possible and desired. This is often associated with the house of Shawaliullah and the legacy of scholars at the Madrasa Rahimiya uh, there in Mughal Delhi. Okay, uh, in this distinctive syllabus, we should say, there's a focus on engaging the text directly. There's a focus on engaging the text. So between 1738 and 1743, we begin with this translation that's already been referenced, the Fatul Rahman. But as you go through this, a lot of people don't know this, two of his sons, right, Abdul Aziz and uh, Rafi al-Din, both create translations of the Quran in Urdu. And what's fascinating is they both take different approaches, right? One is going to take a more literal approach, and the other is going to take a more dynamic approach. But one thing that they share in common is the register. They're convinced that the, the language used should be one that is understandable even for the common artisan, right? So the person they are speaking to from the mosque, the people they're interacting with, should be able to understand what's being said. That is an important principle for them. While well, remaining profoundly attuned to the spiritual practices of their Sufi heritage, for lack of a better word, uh, what Marsha Hermanson has called a post tariqa Sufism that's going to start developing out of there in the Deobandi and Barelvi schools. But the intention throughout it is to provide a clear rendition uh, to it. It's understandable. And this ethos carries forward into their studying, yes, of hadith, of tafsir. Even, even the poetry they start writing is fascinating. Uh, even um, the engagement with journalistic writings will reflect this sense of communicating with people rather than demanding that people kind of climb this mystical ladder to get to the higher phase. There's a desire of reaching down to the people. Lahore was an important center of learning and colonial power. 1862 and 64, we have Foreman Christian College that started uh, by missionaries there. Then you have the government college that is started by the British government. And both are intent on creating young leaders for the East India Company and for the British government there. Of course, uh, about 20 years after that, the Islamia College has started, that's where Yusuf Ali will end up. So it's a region, as I've mentioned, heavy with Christian missionary activity. I think I'll skip uh, this part for, for time's sake, but I would draw attention to the work of E.M. Wary in 1882. His translation of the Quran becomes an international phenomenon published uh, in the U.S. as well. It really gets momentum. In a sense, it, it takes uh, George Sale's place as kind of this is the Quran you want to look at if you want to understand Islam. The problem, of course, is it's very polemical. It's very, very negative. It, it, as you read through the comments, it's very intent on, on, on deconstructing and, and, and insulting, for lack of a better word, uh, the prophet and Islam itself. So within that context, though, uh, Ian Wary's work is growing up. There's also a developing group of Muslim converts to Christianity who are being trained at a small school in Lahore during this period as well. Uh, Robert Clark has a description of that. And it's interesting because some of the people who are converting in that come out of religious training. And so you have histories of the life of the prophet. You have transliterations of the Quran into Urdu, where it's written in Romanized but you're also seeing their involvement in these translation products like that of E.M. Wary. 
So it's an interesting dynamic that's forming there. And that kind of sits in the backdrop, the backdrop of Yusuf Ali's life and work. So residing in Lahore as principal of Islamic College, Yusuf Ali uh, had direct contact with indigenous Christian leaders, British officials and missionaries. He was very aware of their work. But whereas Christians were working to make Urdu a Christian language, there was great energy among Muslims in this context to make English a language of Islam. To be educated in Lahore in this context was to speak English. Those with the best English tend to receive the best postings. As experienced in the mosque and walking in London and in reading his accounts from Lahore, Yusuf Ali did not approve uh, of Ahmadi belief, but he regarded the Deobani and the Bariyabi traditionalists as provincial and quaint, and for being, uh, he didn't like the way they were so apolitical and unengaged. But we see in this time, this, this collaboration of people and some of the conversations we've had before the presentation where people today that we think are so separate, people from the Shia, the Ahmadi, or the rationalist, who would be probably the greatest influencers upon Yusuf Ali, right? They're interacting and they're writing, they're corresponding. They're still praying together in the same mosques. Let's talk about the translation. Yusuf Ali's scholarship of the Quran was published in installments between 1934 and 37 by Sheikh Muhammad Ashraf and Lahore's Kashmiri Bazaar. Um, his name, as his biography from Muhammad Sharif actually noted, became instantly recognizable in the English speaking world. I had to think about that. I, I, I don't know if that's actually accurate or not. But over the next 20 years, I bet it did. These were collated into two volume edition of some 1,754 pages, over 6,000 notes, 11 appendices, each appendice being a short essay addressing an important topic. And this is what's important, I think also, if you go back and you look at the first um, publications, the calligraphy and the printing were of the highest standard. If you heard a first, uh, if you hold a, uh, in your hand, a first edition of some of these, uh, you can't help but being enamored by the Yusuf Ali, the binding, the writing, it's so beautiful. And he knows that. In his introduction, he makes a point of, of establishing that qualification and, uh, and, and putting it, he even mentions uh, Al-Azhar and at least the, the Egyptians, not because he needs a fatwa, but saying, hey, I'm using their, their script. What I'm using is approved by them. And it's uh, supported, yes, by the Himayat here and Alama Iqbal. And so he's appealing to that lineage, even though he's not having uh, to, to travel there and, and uh, seek that type of support. The translation itself was as good and arguably better than some of the other extant versions, but not obviously so. I've even heard comments from some of you this morning. I don't know, they're both pretty good, or this one's pretty good. What, you know, so what is it that makes one successful? It's interesting to think of. You saw these work succeeded ahead of his competitors, I think, because of one vital aspect. It was designed not only to provide a message of moral revival, but also to engage the reader in the spiritual dimension of Islam. Consistent with the South Asian approach, he structured the work according to Sipadas, right? Dividing 30 divisions for those wanting to memorize and guide new readers in the process of memorization. Also for important occasions where the Quran is recited in its entirety for blessing and commemoration. The accompanying Arabic adds authority and solemnity reminding the reader of the presence of the original, even if only symbolic to those who cannot access its meaning or the liturgical value experience in recitation. Rather than preparing a history essay, for example, on the culmination of revealed religion in Islam, he began the volume with an extensive poem, 33 stanzas, 11 verses each, as an introduction and honor to the prophet, his calling and fidelity. The text is intended to be used. It's intended to need not just be on the shelf and pulled out for footnotes, but to be read in a daily liturgical, devotional, communal practice of the faith. Another indicator of the inventory nature, the desire to, to invite others to understand Islam, right, is the careful inclusion of these appendices, right? They address areas of contention, particularly for those who are living amongst Christians. 
these appear as follow and uh, you know, on the abbreviated letters, for example, talking about the rationality or the, the history of the book, he goes into that. But it, right after that, the second one is on the Torah. What is, what is the Torah? The next one, on the NGO, what is the NGO? And he goes on down through there addressing elements that he know will be uh, of difficulty for those living amongst Christians, right? Helping them have an answer that they can hand over to someone or that they can read and understand. Uh, the author also provides an index at the back of the book. So if you're looking for a key term, that's quite handy. Okay, the translation from first to last is a work of Allah. It is prepared for English speakers seeking to understand Islam and for Muslims and their families, their kin living in an Anglophone world. In his commentary of Surah 12, for example, in Surah Yusuf, 106 to 108, addressing the need, he, he, he you know, it's interesting, um, he talks about this idea of idolatry and associating partners with God. And I think this gives you a little taste of his style and of his tone. Islam holds fast to the one central fact in the spiritual world, the unity of God, and all reality springing from him and him alone. In our inner world, this sense of God is as clear as sight in the physical world. Therefore, Mustafa and those who really follow him in the truest sense of the word call all the world to see this truth, feel this experience, follow this way. They will never be distracted by metaphysical speculations whose validity will always be doubtful nor be deluded with phantoms which may lead men astray. He calls to what he sees as a solid, trustworthy way, but he is going to continue again in that South Asian De La Vie school of thought that is scripturalist and philosophical with a deep sense of, of the spirit of the text. So that's going to characterize his work, and that's consistent with that heritage. Oh, I'll move through quickly. He, you know, he provides uh, resources to the text. And I think as a summary statement, he is providing a way for someone who is uninitiated, someone who didn't grow up in the neighborhood, going to the mosque daily or weekly, someone living in, in, in Brighton or Bristol in London, to have access to the text and have a step-by-step -step guide into understanding what's going on. Uh, for lack of a better word, it's almost like a Quran for dummies. Uh, if we have the publishing series in the US, I won't assume that you know what it is, but it is something that's intended to be a beginner's guide. And he successfully does that while continuing the eloquence and the elegance of his work. He doesn't make you feel like a dummy. He meets you where you're at and walks you forward. Uh, he does provide some very strong statements um, about uh, the, his view of Christians and Jewish persons and the status of their book. He does not mince words. The Torah and the Injil have been changed. They're no longer accessible. They're no longer of great spiritual value, period. There's no mincing of words for him in that. Just as the Torah is not the Old Testament or the Pentateuch has now received by the Jews and Christians, so the Injil mentioned the Quran is certainly not the New Testament, is not the four gospels as now received by the Christian church, but an original gospel which promulgated by Jesus as the Torah was promulgated by Moses and the Quran by Muhammad um, Mustafa. So I think it's important to, to realize, yes, that, that he is coming through this in a gentle way, but in his references and in his appendices, he is very clear that there is one right faith and this is the one faith. The others are misguided. Now he does advocate in the spirit of Sayyid Ahmed Khan, uh, a conviviality. Yes, we should be in relationship. Yes, we should interact. Yes, we should read and write and exchange, but is not from a position of dialogue or exploration unto an improvement of the Muslim faith. Uh, we're almost out of time, but let's think of what happens after this. An appreciation for his work, really, if we talk about his global success, right? I think there have been three editions or three printings by the time of his death. But um, really, it was, it was when it becomes... Uh, the preferred version of the Saudis that it becomes so well known and globally important. Unfortunately, within that, uh, gradually as the revisions are made, and these are usually additions of notes where some of the ironic nature, the, the more gentleness is removed in exchange for more polemical comments, and also some of his references that point to uh, literature 
and point to science, point to things that would engage uh, a, a European, a British, or an American educated person, something that was intended to draw them in, many of those are removed. And so the flavor of what made it Yusuf Ali is, is kind of slowly withdrawn. And what comes up in its place, though published and used under his name, um, is, is less than what it was. And of course, things go even further, um, as has been mentioned already today, when uh, the Hilali and the Musa Khan translation are promoted instead. And I, I, I won't comment on that because what I say would not be positive. So I'll just, I'll move forward. Um, and then there's been efforts to criticize him for his, yes, Shia heritage and kind of almost searching for elements within there that would, that would show some kind of a residue of Shiism within him or to, uh, to, to kind of say something negative about his rationalism. I, I understand that. He's referred to as a neo-mutazili, like Said Ahmed Khan, or, or too much of a Sufi, too much of, of, of like a Barilli in his view of the prophet. So all of that is there. But I think uh, just as, a, as an analysis, it's fascinating because now that he is uh, not promoted by the, the, the fad complex, there's a rediscovery, I would say in the past five to 10 years, of, of the first versions. And at least from one side that I noticed, he continues to be the most downloaded uh, version of, of the online Quran. Maybe you have better references than I do. But from what I found that is, so there's over here 10 million copies of the Hilali and uh, being, being produced annually from Saudi and distributed globally, but still on the, on the internet, there's, there's a hunger, there's an interest uh, in this man and in his work. Hmm. Given more time, <laughs> and you can read this in my in my essay, we would talk about um, his 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 use of language, his source of knowledge, how he knows what he knows, and then we'd look more at the political realm, what's going on in this time, and how that shapes his life and his work and his vision. Uh, and and yes, he is against the two state solution, has already been noticed. He's not going to support that. Um, his death, I would say, is tragic. Everyone felt very embarrassed about that. The, the embassy of, of Pakistan in, in, uh, in London is you know, trying to make reparations soon thereafter and understand what happened. But a lot of this, again, goes back to that personal experience of alienation, of, of living in a country no longer, uh, no longer what you thought it was. In his early life, he, was, he had such a love for all things British, and he had such a, a defense for this vision of the empire which is something that uh, we see a lot in South Asia, in, in the writings of, of, of Gandhi himself. There was such a love for the empire in the early days, but then this sense of loss in the end and of betrayal. And I think he experienced that uh, in a political aspect, but I would say most importantly for him and in his work on a personal level. The loss of family, the loss of friends, the homelessness that he experienced there. Let me end there and we'll have conversation over questions. Thank you.